Um, and and in, in a sense, this is how the sort of the classical um, evolutionary um, thinking has gone. He says, I was taught it when I was in school. But um, you're, you're really looking at, uh, way above the subatomic level. You're looking at someone who's got five fingers, someone who's got six fingers, or whatever the case may be. Right. And, and through natural selection and survival of the fittest, mm -hmm. uh, the person who is most capable of dealing with environment and all of that wins. But what you're saying is um, it's way beyond that. There's, mm -hmm. uh, there, there's a, a, a braille system, as you say, beneath mm -hmm. those mattresses. And um, somehow that has to be detected. It has to be detected, but it's inconceivable that it it's could be It's inconceivable it could be detected. And so uh, here's another uh, example would be um, if, if you go to a middle school biology class, they would present it as in a very simple way. Where you have a group of organisms and two or three of them are mutant, or they have some dysfunction, and yeah. one or two of them is extra good because it's had a beneficial mutation. So you just select away the bad individuals and let the best individual have extra children and it's just all going to keep getting better. The reality is everybody's mutant mm. and, uh, and basically all the differences, they're mass, everybody carries tens of thousands of mutations and the differences, each mutation has a minuscule effect, immeasurably small, so that the selection process has nothing to really grab hold of. Right. Yeah. No foothold. Now, your book is called Genetic Entropy which by its very title suggests something stunning. Um, so much is predicated, again, on the evolutionary perspective, on um, new information being added, uh, mm -hmm. of uh, new things being created. The point you make on the genetic level is that there's nothing new being created. Rather, what has been created is we're actually losing mm -hmm. entropy. There's this principle of uh, things slowing down, and you actually suggest in your book that just as we readily accept uh, the universe's heat death one day, mm -hmm. one day uh, in the far future, mm -hmm. we, we, we undergo a, a, a gene death. We, mm -hmm. uh, the human race no longer mm -hmm. will have enough to, to survive. Right. Now, is, is, is this news? Uh, are there others who are saying this, others who are admitting this? Or are you on the, uh, on the cutting edge of something here? Uh, how, 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 is, how is this thesis seen by your fellow scientists? Right. So it's kind of a trade secret amongst population geneticists. Any really well-informed population geneticist understands that man is degenerating. Uh, and so uh, basically you can find great quotes. Uh, there's a, a, a paper written uh, a while back by a, a prominent population geneticist. And the title of the paper is, Why Are We Dead 100 Times Over? And he's basically addressing the problem. Things should be going down, not up. And so in deep geological time, we should have been extinct a long time ago. Um, uh, a more recent paper by Michael Lynch, just published just a year and a half ago, uh, looks at the human mutation problem. And he concludes that uh, the human race is degenerating at 1 to 5% in terms of loss of fitness per generation. That's the, for the human race is degenerating rapidly, is what he concludes. And it could be as high as 10% depending on exactly what the mutation rate is. So he's acknowledging the problem, and he's saying in, a, in, in, a, in the relatively near future, we will see significant impairment of, the human, of human functionality. And so this is really uh, one of the population geneticists I was speaking with said, basically every human geneticist acknowledges that the human race is degenerating. But if, if, if those stats are even close to being correct, if you project backwards, th that means that the human race is a lot younger than uh, we have been led to believe it is. Well, you'd think, you'd think that, that would be a logical train of thought. That's why we should have been dead 100 times over. That's what Kondrashoff is basically saying. Yeah. Why aren't we dead 100 times over? He would, he would definitely believe that that's not true, that, we're, that the, we trace back to the first bacterium, which you know, evolved maybe 4 billion years ago. And yet, if it's down, not up, how can that be? And so um, most of the population geneticists who would acknowledge that we have a huge degeneration problem imagine, well, it couldn't have been that way in the past, so selection must have been much more efficient in the past. So maybe if we st stop taking care of the ill or helping the weak, perhaps we could get more uh, natural selection and uh, perhaps stop the problem. Well, there's a fine line between that and uh World War II eugenics. So I, I, the eugenics philosophy is just under the surface within yeah. the evolutionary community. 
and uh, they, I'm sure that they're thinking about it, but I'm sure that they don't want to go uh, talk about it. Um, the problem is, I, I've looked, I've spent years looking at this, and we've done very careful numerical simulations, increasing the no amount of death and uh, increasing the intensity of selection doesn't stop it. The problem is so fundamental that, that just increasing selection pressure does not solve it. It doesn't even come close to solving it. This is the essence of aging. And so one of the things that uh, Michael Lynch in his recent paper mentioned was he said, because of the nature of this degenerative process in our own body, there is no prospect for any type of scientific breakthrough to significantly extend our lifespan beyond what it is. That's really fundamental and it's very personal because we are experiencing genetic entropy personally. No one can contest that. Personal genetic entropy is an uncontestable fact that no scientist on the planet can deny because it is why we die. And, and so what's happening is every gene in every chromosome of every cell in my body is mutating. And so that guarantees my aging and my death. But the problem is that these mutations that are accumulating in my body, some of them are transmitted to my children. And so, in fact, um, I take the genes, all the mutations that I inherited from my ancestors, which is tens of thousands of deleterious mutations in my body, and then I add my own contribution to that, about a hundred new mutations at least, and pass it on to the next generation. So what we have here is not only the, this, this deep, the kind of a personal tragedy, this is what causes us to die, uh, but it's passed on to our children. And so it's a tragedy for all of humanity and it keeps getting worse. It means that we are a perishing people living in a dying world. And that is so profound and so it makes the, the, the need for salvation and a savior so personal and so immediate because there's no circle of life where things just keep staying the same. And it's not an upward spiral of evolution. Things keep getting better and better. It is a downward spiral exactly as described in scripture. And so it's uh, my research, I thought, would, um, I realized it had major implications for evolution, but I had no, um, I couldn't have guessed how profound the biblical implications are, how profoundly uh, the evidence supports the biblical perspective of a dying universe and a dying world, and that we are dying because of the fall, and that we desperately, our only hope our only hope is Christ.